to another episode of the Hue Capital Podcast with yours truly, Jerlisa Juju Fontaine. So I know you guys always hear me say this, but I'm excited. I always am. I can't help it. And I have to always say that. But I really do feel like I bring the best guests to my podcast to speak with you all so that you can learn from them and probably even pursue the things that they pursue. And the reason why I'm typically excited to introduce you all to them is because I actually know them. <laughs> like, that's the best part. Like, I know these people. So it makes it even more exciting and more fun because we can share stories, share experiences. They're not strangers to me. So I think that makes it really fun. Now, you know who I am, but today you're here for somebody else. So today we have Assemblyman Kenneth Burgos. <laughs> He's so humble. <laughs> But uh, fun fact, so we actually went to undergrad together, and honestly, Kenny, that's his nickname, so from now on you're going to hear me say Kenny, because we don't do too professional here, but uh, Kenny is honestly really intelligent, really funny, also a fun person on top of funny, and he's just really good vibes. Like, when I think about Kenny, I think about someone that, one, you can look up to, they can be a role model of yours, no matter what age group you're in. But I also think about someone you can go to the bar with and catch a drink with and catch a vibe with and travel with. He travels. Like, he knows how to have a good time. So, just putting that out there. But anyway, that's Kenny. Kenny, I can give a whole intro introduction about you, but I think you can go ahead and do it yourself. No, I'll tell you one thing, that was the nicest introduction I've ever had. Thank you. Stop, stop. <clears throat> but yeah, she said, I'm a seven Kenny Burgos. I go by Kenny. Um, the only person that calls me Kenneth is my mother, so... I stay with Kenny for... Don't talk on that. Well, yeah, so, um, you know, if you don't know what a assembly is, I represent uh, 130,000 people here in the Bronx, so I cover the neighborhoods so of Soundview, Hunts Point, Classic Point, kind of area, um, and I represent them in the, in the legislature. I love that. And I think what's so interesting to me about, like, Kenny's journey is, like, when I knew you in Albany, I never knew politics was even, like, a thing for you until I started seeing you participate more in student government, in Senate, so typically I start a different way where I typically start with understanding someone's upbringing and their background, but I'm gonna change it up a little bit. I wanna know when did your interest for politics even start? Well, your first comment is right. I mean, when I was an undergrad, politics was not <clears throat> in my trajectory. I didn't really know much about politics. Um, I, when I was in high school, I couldn't tell you the difference between a Democrat and Republican, to be quite honest. You know, my household didn't vote. Um, parents weren't civically engaged. and my start was exactly what you said. So my roommate, Jerry Shimon, you know very well, yeah. ran for student government, and he asked me to run on his ticket to be a senator for the school. And I said, sure, put my name on the ticket. To be honest, I didn't campaign at all. I just completely rode Jerry's coattail, uh, and I won. And when we got involved and went into meetings, I actually enjoyed it. I said, wow, this is, this is pretty cool how you know a body of X amount of students is able to impact what's going on here in the university. Yeah. Uh, and then from there, you know, I used that opportunity and leveraged it into an internship where I got a job at city council, New York city council. And I was an econ major. I wanted to be, you know, a financial analyst, work on wall street, one of those things, you name it. So just went to city council just to build a resume, but even felt more in love there, right? I got to see this hundred billion dollar city budget and how it impacts every single New Yorker here. And I'm just, you know, a college intern doing my little piece, and, and I just fell in love with it. So, luckily for me, after college, I applied for a full-time job at City Council, and my local representative hired me. So, I was, what, 21, 22, fresh out of college, and I was working for my local council member as a, a deputy chief of staff slash budget director. So, honestly, a great opportunity to start out with. Uh, but it was a neighborhood that I grew up in. Yeah. Like, I was, like, I was born here on Watson Ave, and I'm over here, you know, working with my council to make sure, you know, there's trash cans on the corner, to make sure the schools have programming, to make sure the parks are being upgraded. And, I, again, fell more and more in love with it. I got involved politically with the Democratic Party here in the Bronx, uh, worked in council for something like five or six years, and then the opportunity came in 2020 um, to run for office. Hey. And I was 26, and I said, people are not crazy enough to vote for me. Um, but I ran. I won, and now the rest is history. And now we're in his office <laughs> with these flags. By the way, there were multiple places that we could have did this, by the way, y'all. But to be honest, I thought this was the flyest thing in the office. So I figured, yeah, there's no way we're not going to record this interview without this in the background. 
This just shows how official he is. She's being nice. I'm here yeah. on the side. She's being nice. Board. Nothing else is decorated in the office. <laughs> this is the only part of the office that is decorated. He's <laughs> the only part that's appropriate. For, <laughs> for this photos right now. Literally that. But the reason why I wanted to start there was because I also, as you all know, was a part of student government. And I think that sometimes people downplay um, just getting involved with student government. Yeah. They don't necessarily see the value in it. They think it's for fun. They think it's games, but to be honest, at least for our student government, it was a legit 501c3 foundation. Yeah. Like, this is a real nonprofit. Yeah. Like, if you do anything crazy with the money, you may end up somewhere you don't want to be at some real thing, right? So, I just really want to highlight that because I think that for anybody who's listening who may still be in like undergrad, if you are somebody who is pursuing politics, governments, maybe social impact related work, don't sleep on your student government. Don't sleep on your student organizations. Like, that could really be the opportunity for you to put on your resume. Not only on your resume, but you can speak to it during your interviews for jobs. And you can tell people, like, this is what I accomplished with a group of people that was also elected by the student population to perform A, B, C, D, E. And people are very impressed by that because the reality is, if you're on a campus with, let's say, 14,000 students, there's not more than, what, 20 senators? 30, 40? What was it? I'll be quite honest with yeah, I don't remember either. I don't know. But I think but 20 or 30 sounds right. That sounds about right, right? Like you're really 20, you're one out of 20 or 30 people out of a pool of 14,000. And someone's going to be very impressed by that. So I just want to say to you, like, I really like, I love that. Like, I think that's a huge deal. You took something that was student involvement, volunteer work, and said, <clears throat> finance guy, that's lit. Politics guy, that's also lit. But I'm going to go this route. I have the experience for it. I can do that. So shout outs to you. Now we're going to come back to all the career stuff because I want to get um, a better understanding of what does the day-to-day -day look like of an assembly man. Sure. But before I get there, you mentioned something important. You grew up in the Bronx. You yeah. grew up on Watson Ave Street? Watson Ave. Watson Ave. Yeah. So help me understand like what was it like <clears throat> growing up in the Bronx, being Latino? Yeah. Like, talk a little bit about that. All right. Well, stick with me because explaining my, my upbringing is always kind of mm -hmm. <laughs> confusing. So born on Watson Ave, me and my mom. My parents just split up, but like, you know, I had both parents in my life just separately. So I lived, you know, at one point in Watson. My dad was an elder. Pops moved to the Rock's Neck. Mom moved to Fordham. So I've lived everywhere in the Bronx, I like to think. Uh, but essentially, you know, grew up in this area, born and raised. Um, went to school, public schools, went to Catholic school for some time. Um, and then eventually just made it to Bronx Science. And Bronx Science, I would say, is probably where, you know, probably my, my career, edu both educationally and professionally, that turn right like, but before you keep going yeah. can you tell them what bronx science is like don't sleep like let them know what kind of school that is bronx science is um one of the specialized one of eight specialized high schools in new york city you have to take the shsat to get involved and, and to be enrolled in there i was lucky enough to pass by the razor thin margin <laughs> um but really it was a great experience you know i mean i fought my mom tooth and nail about going there i wanted to transfer first day because i said i don't relate to any of these kids there. i said these kids were from manhattan and queens their parents were scientists. Yep. I had a guy who his parents were a UN ambassador. I'm like, my mom works a variety. <laughs> He's like, I can't relate to this. Yeah, so I, I didn't feel part of the school body at all. I'm like, I wanted to go to Lehman High School. Yeah. I want to go with my friends. I wanted to, you know, I wanted to be cool. I didn't want to be a nerd. Um, but my mom made me stay there, and it was the best decision ever, honestly, because I think that experience into not just different cultures, but you know, students from all over New York City and, and what their upbringing was and, and, and how it was for them growing up in New York City, that was an eye-opener for right. me. And what they aspired to be and what they had done so far. I mean, I, I was able to, to basically view the world through two lenses, right? right? Essentially, I can go back home to my neighborhood and my family. I can see what we're experiencing and, and the world that we see. Right. But then I would go to Bronx Science five times a week and, and speak to an entirely different world. Mm. And, you know, from there, I, I'm able to kind of break it down and, and see what I believe works best for me, what would be the best fit for me, what do I want out of my life. Uh, and, and I've taken that lens with me up until this day, and I think it's really one of the biggest experiences that has brought me here. And Bronx Science, I say, you know, went to Bronx Science, then went to UAlbany. Um, and, and that was, as we said, you know, student government, obviously a huge experience, but obviously undergrad as a whole is a huge experience. That's where I think you really find your true character and, and, and who it is you want to be. Yep. Um, and I, I always joke and say when I left Albany, I said I was never coming back to the city. And now I work there for half the year. <laughs> I'm like, I said that too. The yeah. only difference between me and I is, 
I actually have not really been back. No. He actually has to go back because his job and his career requires that. Ironically enough. But I want to pinpoint something, right? Mm -hmm. Thinking about your transition from Bronx High School of Science, which, by the way, y'all, I applied for that school and I did not get in. So that's why I had to make him brag real quick because right. it is not easy to get into any of those specialized high schools. But most of you probably know that if you're from New York City. Shout out from Redaction. Ooh, hey. <laughs> so people might not like that, but ooh, hello, that's right. But uh, what I want to highlight is two different things. The first thing I want to start with is you mentioned experiencing something in high school that a lot of us who probably went to a Lehman or a Clinton don't get to find out until college. Yeah. And what that thing is, is the different types of careers that you can pursue. Yeah. For a lot of us who come from African American backgrounds, Latino backgrounds, like your parents are probably telling you, engineer, teacher, Doctor, lawyer, if it's not that, don't no. do it. Yeah. But you went to a school with people who had parents that were doing different things. Can you like itemize maybe a couple mm. of different career routes that you learned about that you never knew if you didn't go to Bronx High School? Sure. And, and it wasn't even that maybe you didn't know about these careers, but I, I would say more so those careers just didn't even feel attainable. Mm. Okay, right? fair. It was just that no one in my family, no one in my community had those jobs. Right. Everyone I knew, like I said, or for Verizon, was a technician, work for MTA, mm -hmm. was a police officer, you, you know, not, I don't want to, I, I, I don't want to degrade those careers, great right. careers, but those are the only careers that we were aware mm -hmm. of, right? Mm -hmm. As I said, not just ambassador and scientists, I mean, uh, I had a friend whose parents was a writer. Uh, mm -hmm. I had a friend who, whose parents were consultants, which I didn't know what the hell a consultant was until oh. now. <laughs> um, so just careers that I think that you're, you're exposed to and you start seeing an actual possibility. I, I think in life as humans, we don't believe anything is possible until you have that real world example. Yeah. Until there's at least some sort of connection to it. Like, oh, I know someone that did that. Yeah. Or I know someone who, who knows someone yeah. that has done that or is doing that. That's when it really becomes real. So I think, I think you're right. I think Bronx Science was a four year kind of precursor to college yep. that really you know, shaped me well ahead of most kids maybe who didn't have that experience, right? And when we say most kids, like you said, kids from our community, yep. in Bronx and Brooklyn, the outer boroughs, who didn't have the opportunity to go to some of these elite institutions because, you know, thankfully Bronx Science is a public school and that's mm -hmm. why I have the opportunity. But a lot of the kids that went to that school previously were in private schools yeah. up until then or were in some super expensive tutoring to get to this school. Yep. So again, just seeing what they did to get there, seeing what I did to get there, to see the work I had to put in to stay there compared right. to them, like, it, it just really naturally draws this comparison. Uh, but but I think if you look at it analytically, you're like, okay, this is what I have to do. Yep. This is what works, this is what doesn't. And that's what I've carried on for so long. I love that. By the way, do you all enjoy listening to him? Because I know I do. This was good. <laughs> so the other thing that I wanted to get at was another thing that you were, you were able to learn about prior to going to Albany is the concept of diversity, inclusivity, yes. right? You mm -hmm. went to a school where... I mean, usually we're, we're the minorities in a lot of institutions like this, but this was the first time you really had to feel like a minority because you're from the Bronx. Yeah. It's a lot of people who look like us in any sort of neighborhoods that we're in. Yeah. So what I want to understand is, as a professional in politics and government, how do you feel like being exposed to this concept of diversity and inclusivity at the high school, then college level, mm -hmm. prepare you for your role and what you care about and do? I would say one of the things that I carry with me and I tell folks all the time is whatever space you're in, be uncommon, mm. right? And by that, I kind of mean, it, it means obviously be yourself in some ways, right? Because I was uncommon in Bronx Science, right? I was one of the few kids actually from the Bronx. I was a kid going there with true religion jeans, a BB Simon Bell, and a Pele Pele jacket, right? That's but, hilarious. <laughs> and, but the reality was, I was. So you had all these kids that were confused. They were like, this kid doesn't look like the mold of a Bronx science student. Mm -hmm. How'd you get in here? They ask, you know, they start to ask, you know, very particular questions mm -hmm. like, what do your parents do? Or, 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 or what school did you go to? Mm -hmm. Have you ever been in a gang? Like, it's oh! some, some stupid question, I'll be honest. Ooh. So when you go from there, I'm uncommon in Bronx science. I think in college, I felt a lot more at home. I think, you know, it was certainly more communities and people that were like minded like me. Uh, but then you go into politics, and again, Uncommon again, right? Mm -hmm. You have people whose career paths have been set on politics. You have people whose families are politically connected. Yep. Um, and here I was again, someone who didn't know politics, the ins and outs, someone who did not plan to have a career here, but I've always brought my natural self. Right? I'm going to assimilate into an environment 
at the same time not change who I am, right? I'm gonna learn, pick and pick and learn, you know, okay, I have to you know, be a bit smarter here, or I have to be a bit, a bit more cognizant of, of this issue, but at the end of the day, I'm gonna be who I am. Yep. And even in politics, I'm quote unquote in common, right? Yep. So it ties back to your question on diversity and inclusion. I mean, you have to expose people to these yep. things, right? The only, the only way people are exposed to these different worlds and different cultures and communities is if you're gonna bring your natural self. Exactly. It serves no purpose if you're gonna be the only black person, you're the only Latino person in a work office, in, in an environment, in, in politics, and all you're gonna do is fully assimilate to what that culture right. is and not bring who you are. Yep. So when you go there and you show them, you're the representation, right? You're, especially if you're one or two, you've got a big weight on your shoulders. Mm -hmm. It may be the first, you know, someone's first time interacting with someone from the Bronx. It may be first time they're interacting with a person of color. Yep. Um, so you, you wear that weight. But you know, you, you take that responsibility. You still hold your true to your character to what your upbringing is, uh, and I think that's really important. Diversity and inclusion. I love that. And when I listen to that, this there's one word that stands out to me the most. It is the word of uncommon, yeah. and I translate that to uniqueness. Right? <laughs> I feel like to your point, it's pretty bad when someone who is either black or Latino is being hired into a certain space where, unfortunately, there is a lack of representation of theirs. But if you start to develop this habit of dimming your uniqueness, then what you're doing is you're still allowing the same problem to exist, right? You're basically saying, okay, listen, thank you so much for hiring me. Thank you for paying me. Thank you for bringing me here. But now I'm going to conform to how everybody else is because, well, if you brought me here, I should be like everyone else. And in reality, that, that doesn't work, right? Because you want other people who look like you to be welcome into these spaces, but they also deserve to be who they really are. And being who they are doesn't make them less professional. They're just literally who they are. Like if that person wears BB belts and true religion jeans and Ugg boots, they should be able to do that because all that really matters is their attitude, how they treat people, what's in here, bringing your brilliance to the table. And I feel like to Kenny's point, going through high school and having that very unique experience going to Albany where, even though we say Albany was diverse, we felt it because we had people on campus who lived there, but statistically, you can't really say it's like really the most diverse thing in the world, right? But we also stood within our own communities too. Exactly, yeah. and that's why I said like on campus, we felt it, but it's because we usually lived on campus. Like most of us are coming from New York City, whether it be Brooklyn, Queens, Bronx, etc. So when we get there, to Kenny's point, you see your folks, you unite with them, and that's pretty much what you know until you start tapping into things like student government. Yeah. That's when you start seeing a little bit more mixture of people who you can engage with and learn more from. So I love that. What I also want to do now is talk about, okay, cool. We know how important diversity and inclusion is, yeah, yeah. not only because it helps with your work, but because it's something that you can experience, learn, and educate other people on like through this platform. Sure. But I want to get more of insight into like your day to day like what is it like having this beautiful office with these three flags are you ever in this office like what is it like being in the assembly then uh to answer your last question i'm actually rarely in this office mm -hmm. I, I, my staff uses this desk more than me um, but that's because you know if you're a representative the most important thing 90 percent of the job is showing up yep. right so when i say i represent my neighbors 130,000 residents here in this part of the bronx I represent them in all aspects, right? I represent uh, who they are, I represent their family values, I represent what they want to see out of the state. And by doing that, I have to show up to community board meetings, I have to show up to tenant association meetings, to precinct council meetings, mm -hmm. but not just that, show up to community events, right? If a school is having a graduation or um, you know a fair or whatever it may be, showing up just not only shows that I'm part of the fabric of this community, it makes me accessible, right? I can't know what's going on in this area if I am not there engaging with them every day. And then I take those experiences, I take their concerns and their issues, and that's when I go to Albany for six months a year and we craft policy and legislation. And how can the government work better, not just for the state of New York, mm -hmm. but very specifically my neighborhood, mm -hmm. right? Because my people, the people like me, to, to voice their issues. We may have you know, a statewide issue on unemployment, we may have a statewide issue on housing, but when you get down to the hyper-local level, there are very specific issues that have to be addressed mm -hmm. from the state government to help communities here. The issues here in Soundview are not the same 
in Bedside Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. And that's why we have representatives representing all these different neighborhoods to make sure that we have a government that hopefully works for all of us. And that's the idea. So every day is not the same and it can entail a lot more than what I just mentioned, but that's the, the essence of it. I love that. And to be honest, I don't know about you all, but that sounds like a very exciting job. Think about all the people that Kenny gets to meet, by the way. Yeah. Like when you go to these community boards, tenant boards, et cetera, et cetera, like you are meeting so many different people across this district. And even better, you're learning their stories. Yeah. Because in reality, how can you solve problems for people if you, one, have no idea what they care about, what they need, what they want? You can't properly serve that. Yeah. So for you to really get out there and realize, hey, my name is Kenny, and I cannot hide behind my desk. Like, I have to go out there and really interact with people to figure out how to solve their problems. Yeah. So for you all who are listening, if you are in a position where you're trying to pursue a role like this, understand that if you are someone who wants to hide behind your desk, this might not be it for you. But if you are someone who really thoroughly cares about the people and you really want to get out there and solve their problems because it means something to you, this is the job, the desk, the office, the life that you want. I think it expands beyond just politics, right? I think in any career, 95% of careers, you should be exposing yourself to a quote-unquote uncomfortable situation, mm -hmm. right? We talk about Albany and the cliques that we joined because those were comfortable, yep. because of what we know. But the only way you grow in life is being in an uncomfortable situation, right? So, you know, I'm not saying that some of the meetings I go to are uncomfortable, though some of them are, uh, but being in those spaces, you connect with people you normally wouldn't. You connect with organizations, ideas, people with different backgrounds, and, and, and you'll be amazed at what you can find, yep. right? People are impressive. Everyday people are impressive. It doesn't matter what their title is. I mean, you can go, I, I've spoken with folks in my community, you know, older, older senior citizens, 80 years old, and I mean, you hear the story of their life and careers they had, yep. skill sets they carry, yep. and I'm like, you would never imagine this sweet old lady you just run by in the grocery store or something like that. So yep. I, I think just exposing yourself, no matter what the career is, is super important. So just step into an uncomfortable space and, and you will come out strong. I love that a lot, and because of what you just said, I want to put Kenny on the spot. So Kenny, all these stories that you hear about, I want you to give us some insight into what story have you heard from someone who has lived in this district that you felt like, wow, this is why I do my job. Mm. <laughs> Spicy. Sure, no, I mean, there, there's a lot of them. I mean, I, I would say the most rewarding part of this job is when you really know something you work on has had a true impact, right? So if we take our time back to the COVID-19 pandemic, something as simple as food distributions. I had a friend uh, who works at an Apple store and told me that somehow my name came up um, and he was like, oh, you know that guy? He's like, oh yeah, I'm really good friends with him. He's like, that guy gave me a huge uh, grocery bag of food that helped my family through a week you know, a week that we wouldn't have made it. And, and you don't realize sometimes what a small act like that can do for a family. And that's just one story, right? But like, I think an even larger scale is, you know, during that pandemic, we worked on policy like, you know, the ERAP program, which is the Emergency Rental Assistance Program. And we put two and a half billion dollars in this program. We helped hundreds of people just right here in this office stay in their homes. So when you really get to connect the work you do in Albany, you fight, tooth and nail with the Senate and the governor and say we need this kind of program, we need this much money, this is the way a program should run because those, it's a devil's in the details, yeah. right? This program could very well have rolled out and been incredibly difficult to access and almost touch no one. Yeah. But we made sure that it was accessible to people here, to make sure it was language accessible, yeah. to make sure you didn't have to bring, you know, 3,000 pages of documents and, and, and your, your firstborn child to yeah. get it. We made it easily to, easy to access and people were able to get it and stay in their home. So when you have to connect the work you do and all of you see it impact here, that's really most rewarding. So it's hard to get like, you know, just one individual, so but, <clears throat> but when you really like, again, when, when, it, when it comes to fruition, it's a beautiful guy. I love that a lot. And I love that a lot because like I said before, I feel like for a lot of people who are in these roles, people can say, yeah, I have a lot of impact. I do my thing, saving people's lives. But okay, like how do you do that? What have you done for me lately? Right? That's the biggest question that everybody has for people in social impact, politics, government. What have you done for me? My and I, question. You get me? And the, the <laughs> cool thing is, it shows you how passionate Kenny is because he didn't know I was going to ask that question, but he actually had a moment to really think and say, hey, oh yeah, I make impact. Here's how I did it. Housing. 
COVID-19, food, groceries, etc. Like, that's how you know yeah. you're doing your job and you do it well. And also because you also have gotten re-elected for yeah. this role. Second term. You get me? I mean, something is happening here. He's doing something. But what I want to do is also use this as a learning opportunity for people who are, like, trying to get a better understanding of, hey, let's say my name is Julissa. I want to do politics. <clears throat> I don't know what roles exist for in sure. this world. So can you just do like a quick like listing of like let's say you want to focus on New York City. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What are all the different political <clears throat> roles that someone can pursue? I would say politics and government has a career for every industry. Um, some quick ones, obviously, you know, policy analysts, uh, budget directors, communications manager, social media, uh, chief of staff, which is managerial, and those are just some of the very limited titles within like a, an assembly or any government office, but it expands well beyond that. I mean, I tell folks all the time, we have hundreds of state agencies, we have city agencies that handle, you know, the gambit of homeless services, of uh, building compliance, of uh, public safety, law enforcement. I mean, there is literally a career for any industry in public service. And honestly, when you speak to folks, Part of the reason that I got in public service, and I think most people that stay here, is that there's a huge rewarding aspect of it, right? I mean, it's important to make money in this world, and, and that was the route that I initially wanted to go. But when you have a job that you enjoy every day, when you have a job that you feel is impactful, it doesn't have to be impactful just on government policy. You could do <clears throat> homeless services because that's your passion, right? You could work in a nonprofit sector, you know, helping uh, you know women suffering from domestic violence. Mm -hmm. Whatever is your passion, I think it's important to have a career that is rewarding both to help people, but also to fill your cup, right? You can't, there's a saying, right? You, you can't pour from an empty cup. Yep. Um, and it's not to say that other careers in the corporate world are, are, are meaningless, but I, I don't feel that they provide the same amount of reward, like that rewarding feeling as public service. That was thorough and amazing, to be honest. I probably would have said something as common <laughs> as, you could be a Brownsboro president. But to, to his point though, you right? Could be too. You could be that too. But to, yeah, to yeah. his point though, I think it was so important the way you approach that question because People associate an industry with like one or two roles. People, yeah. for example, will hear medicine and say, whoop, doctor, whoop, nurse, yeah. nothing else I can do in medicine when the same thing that Kenny just mentioned also exists in medicine. You can be a social media manager. You can be a community outreach professional. You can be so many things because these roles are all applicable across any industry. They just look a little different only in terms of what the subject matter is, yep. which in this case, if you're a social media manager, maybe you're marketing the different policies that your office has actually like signed off on and implemented and put out, right? That's the only difference. But all these things exist in there. So if you are someone who cares a lot about politics and government and you say, okay, cool, you might want Kenny's job. All right, maybe not. You can still do the social media thing and community outreach thing. The opportunities are endless. And like he just mentioned to you, I mean, I don't know if you guys are like feeling uninspired. I can't imagine how you would be uninspired. But just listening to Kenny and everything that he's done, I feel like really shows you that being in politics and government is meaningful work. And it isn't something that you should shy away from if you even have an itsy bitsy piece of interest in it. Now, what I want to get to, and the reason why I said all of that is because I'm trying to convince you all to kind of go on this path. I want to understand, how does Kenny get elected twice? Like, what are you doing that's working during your campaigns? There's a saying in government, all politics is local. Mm. Right? No matter if you're the President of the United States, if you're a U.S. Senator, if you're the Governor of New York, all politics is local. So I am... You know, people will say, I have no boss. My boss is, you know, the 100,000 people, 100,000 people I represent that yep. vote for me. Um, so how I get elected is to making sure that I am adhering to their needs. And the needs can vary, right? So here in this office alone, we serve as a constituent services office. On a daily basis, we can probably see anything 30 to 40 cases a day. And I'm not going to sit here and tell you that I'm sitting down and taking those cases. I have a wonderful team that represents me, right? The same way when I was a staffer. They're doing the work. They're making sure that people in this neighborhood are helped by a government office. There's no charge here. There's no prerequisite. We don't turn anyone away for any sexual orientation, creed, color, religion, no matter what it is. You walk in the store, you get help. And that's what we do. So I think if you continue to service people, that's why they elect you. And, I, and my hope is that people get a trust in government with that, right? I mean, I think it's normal for most Americans to not trust in government. 
and just know government can work for you. Yep. But you have to make sure you have the right people elected. You have to make sure you're holding those people accountable. You have to make sure you're engaged in the process. And far too often, people that look like us, people from communities of color, people whose parents weren't civically engaged or didn't vote in the past, feel disconnected from, mm. from that system. And it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? The government won't work for you because you continue to disengage with it. Yep. There is power in numbers. And when you learn to organize those numbers, when you learn to say, my community of X, Y, and Z are 10,000 voters, and this is what we care about, I promise you that issue will be addressed. So I'm hopeful that I continue to get elected as long as I do the work. And if I'm not doing the work, they got to push someone else in. As they should, hold someone accountable. Oh, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all know I'm so cheesy. So when I hear all of that, right, I think about campaigning in two different ways. The first one is the groundwork, which I think you gave us a very thorough response to. I think you all captured that really well. But the other part about campaigning is the digital experience, right? So I want you to give us give us some insight into maybe you don't have the technique, but you have a group that does it. Like, what does it look like to campaign digitally? Well, campaigning digitally is actually you know still a relatively new concept, right? The first like major politician to win on that strategy was Obama in '08. You know, it was you know, he tapped into this new resource that no one really understood the power of social media and the internet. Now it's pretty much a prerequisite. Um, social media is a a wonderful tool to connect with, especially obviously younger voters, um, um, people who are uh, perpetually online. Um, and what does that look like? I mean, for me, I always try to make my, like, I handle a lot of my own social media actually. People think, you know, that I have a, a little Gen Zer to handle things, but it's just me. <laughs> but um, what I try to do is I assume most of my audience is in politics 101, meaning they were like me a few years ago. So whenever we're working on policy, budget, groundbreaking, whatever it may be, I try to give that update in layman's terms, right? I try to take away all the jargon, all the fancy words, say, this is what we're doing, this is how it impacts you, this is why you should care. Uh, and it works so far. Mm -hmm. And does that translate always to votes? Maybe, maybe not. My social media is only limited to the people that live in my district. Yeah. Um, but if you wanted to translate that into votes, I mean, there are immense tools, you know, you have to take you have to take the data from, you know, from people who are way smarter than me and see how it applies to the policies you're working on, the age groups and demographics, and really target your message to those voters through robocalls, through text message programs, mm -hmm. through email campaigns, through Facebook ads. I mean, there are a, a litany of tools you can use to make social media and the internet work for you in campaigning. And if you're not using every single one of those tools, you probably won't win. I like that. That was really helpful. Mm -hmm. And as we get towards the end of this interview, because as bad as I can talk to Kenny about this all day, he has a bed to go to. <laughs> so what I want to talk a little bit more about is earlier on, you were talking about in your role, how you have to work with other professionals and other roles in politics. And what I want to get a sense of is what is like the hardest part of your job? When I hear you, I would think it's working with these people. But what do you think the hardest part of your job is? The hardest part is feeling like you you acquired you, you know you you hit this this mark in your career where you have you know quote unquote power and you have solutions that you know can fix the issues that you've either experienced yourself or you see people going through every day mm -hmm. and then realizing democracy is more complicated than yeah that, right uh, there's oftentimes I see people you know scream at a mayor or a governor people have DM'd me and say why don't you fix this and it's not as if I'm not trying to. But when you truly understand the complexity of government and democracy, it expands further than just your assembly members, your yeah. senators, and your governor. You know, there are corporations, there are nonprofits, there are lobbyists, there are advocates, there are communities that all have a completely different idea or a completely different interest in how we can fix this issue or what we should do to fix this issue or the way we get there or if we should fix it at all. Yeah. And you're constantly competing against all these interests that can have money behind them, yeah. that can have people behind them, that can have way more power than you behind them. So it's just not as simple as waving a magic wand, although you know what the solution is. Right. You can know very well how we can fix this tomorrow. Uh, but unfortunately, it's just like you come so far, but it's still not enough. That's okay. You still have, you still have a, a long fight ahead. So that's, that's, that's the toughest part. And I also think about the fact that in Kenny's role, once again, like, Kenny's, Kenny's young, right? Like, he mentioned to you all the first time he got elected, he was 26. Like, you're thinking about the fact that this is a space that's probably dominated by people who are 
much more senior in age yeah. than Kenny, right? And for some people who are of that age group, they're probably looking at Kenny like, boy, stop it, you could be my son, you my nephew, like, I can't take you seriously. And in his role, he has to come as his best self to ensure that they listen to him. And not listen to him because they pity him, oh, little cute guy, you're in politics. No, like, I'm a man, I represent thousands of people who are asking for something, and I need you all to listen to me and take me seriously. And I think that commanding that respect alone is extremely hard. So that's just my input in terms of what I think is really hard about Kenny's role and what he has to do, especially just being who he is. But something else that I thought about that I also think is very hard is sometimes people may feel like if I held this political role and I don't do this anymore, am I just done in life? Like, if I stop politics, is there anything else I can do? Kenny. Okay. If someone does what you do and they do two terms and say I'm done with politics in terms of being like an actual political leader, what else can they do? Well, I mean, for one, there's a government affairs job in every single corporation out there. You get it? But that's not, you know, joking aside, I mean, it, it, it's what you make of it, right? Because you can come here and I, I sit on the committees for labor, transportation, correction, consumer affairs, and election law. And as an elected official, you're often asked or told, you should become an expert in one of these arenas, right? <clears throat> so you can leave here with a five or 10, 20 year career and really be an expert in these fields. You know, when you're working with these committees, when you're working with the analysts, and again, all the interested parties uh, as it relates to those committees, right? If you're on the Committee on Labor, you can be an expert on labor issues yeah. when it comes to labor law, when it comes to construction compliance, when it comes to safety. So you can leave here still and have a fruitful career after and all the while still providing that public service, right? Leaving here with a legacy and saying, these are issues you've worked on, you know, based on your experience and what you thought was the best fit, and hopefully leave a legacy of people behind you, right? Because I'm always, you know, lift as you climb, right? Yeah. So you get to be in this role, but also build new leaders who will hopefully one day take your role and take a whole bunch of other roles and maybe make the government even better than the way you left it. Uh, so there's certainly a career for you after politics. This this isn't, you know, the end of the world. I love that. So I have like two more questions for Kenny, but Kenny, before I ask you those questions, because they're very like fast paced questions, yeah. um, is there anything else that you want to share with everybody who's listening, just to put it in perspective for you? This can be someone who is an <clears throat> undergraduate student. Yeah. This can be someone who just graduated and started their first political job. This can be someone who does not even work in politics and realize, oh my God, I'm doing the wrong line of work. Yeah. I've got to change it to politics. Like any advice you have for any of those groups of people? Uh, don't be scared. Don't be scared to jump, right? So, as I as I kind of said most of this time, again, I was kid from the Bronx, first to graduate college, um, first to get involved in politics, and but but most of those were because I put myself in those uncomfortable situations, right? I never told myself I don't belong in that room. I never told myself uh, I'm, I'm not I'm not you know I'm not up to par for the, for this area. So whatever arena in, whether you're undergrad or looking to change careers. Just take that leap. Yep. I mean, you know, it may not make sense at first, but you can look back two, three, four years later, and I promise you will. I love that. Now, before I ask my final question, I want to get rid of the serious real quick right. and bring on the fun. Right. This wasn't fun? Oh, this was fun. This, <laughs> this was very fun, by the way. First of all, we're both fun people, so yeah. it's always fun. But I want to change the tone. That's what I mean by fun. Okay. I want to know, what was like your favorite Albany memory? <laughs> and I don't want to hear it's when I was in Senate and I made this pop no I want to know yeah. what was your favorite Albany my memory my favorite Albany memory is probably between one of the later trail gates during homecoming weekend or if not one of the barbecues in that park I can't remember the name of the park but we all went to that park like 30-40 minutes out that you're probably not allowed to anymore I'm sorry if you're in Albany now um, but yeah, I love, you know, day drinking event, barbecue, like yeah. those are my things, like in bed by nine o'clock watching Netflix and you're fresh for the next day. <laughs> those are my favorite events at all. And then shout out to Frap, your Frap. I heard about the attorney and corporate baby. Hello. Tell us a real chapter. Hey, you get that? So listen, if anybody's <laughs> trying to be weak life, listen, check out the Ayolas, they do what they think, you get me? But I had to make sure we got that out there because we had fun in Albany, so I had to make sure y'all know, like once again, professional. Take the suit off. He still has a good time. Don't change who you are for a role. Still be yourself. Still have your fun. She thought I'm about to <laughs> I was like, will he answer it? But he did that. Now, my actual final question okay. to you is, I want to know, what does the future of politics look like? 
the future of politics, if in my vision, is people who are younger are more engaged. I mean, that's been something people have been trying for decades, right? And I don't want it to sound cliche, but I often tell folks, people that tell me, oh, I don't do politics. I'm like, well, politics don't do you. Because the number one voting population is people over 55 years old. Yeah. And it's not to be ageist, it's not to you know, be discriminatory on, on people born in a certain era, but you're allowing people who are at the later end of their lives to dictate what the rest of your life will look like. Yeah. Because policy takes years to come to fruition, right? We, we often have to see it years down the road. So by you not being engaged, you're allowing others to dictate what your neighborhood looks like. So I'm hopeful the future of politics has more women, has more people of color, has people from all backgrounds, from, from any perspective you can bring. If you have a community you represent, small or large, I'm hoping they're involved because that's what democracy is built on. More voices, more inclusion, and just more people at the table deciding things to work for the majority. But if, again, if you allow a single population to retain that power, always be that way. That was phenomenal. Kenny, thank you so much for this interview. Once again, for everybody who's listening, I hope you had your notepad out, hope you had your pen out, and you were taking notes. Once again, you may be an undergraduate student, you may be an early career professional, you may be someone who is looking to transition into politics. Whatever it is, all of this was still applicable, and I really hope that you all take this information and use it so that one day your office can have these three flags. <laughs> Where's the word of my Amazon? <laughs> Imagine. But thank you all so much for listening. Take care, everybody. Thank you, everyone.